Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ian Barton. It's always a terrible thing when your name is bigger than you, isn't it? It's just a hell of a thing to deal with when you start off. Well, thank you very, very much for coming out. I know it's late in the day, and hopefully we'll make things a little bit of fun for you and a little bit of entertaining. I always like to be provocative in the things that I talk about because that's how we learn. We debate to learn. Uh, we don't just sit and listen to lectures to learn. And so my goal in any of these is to try and offend everyone in the room at least once. Okay. So if you feel offended at any stage, this is a good thing. Okay. Just go with me. You'll also note that um, I've got Imperial Logistics and the SAPEX logo up this year. Um, consistently at SAPEX, I always get given into trouble. I get a row for only having used the Imperial logo and somebody gets offended. So this year I've gone for balance. All right, Michelle, you're proud of me. Hmm? I want to start off, we're going to be talking about why the hell there's not more supply chain professionals in the healthcare space. Many of you will have been to the talks earlier today, Dominique's talk on people that deliver, about trying to professionalize the people who work in public health. You'll have heard um, Tripp talking about helping the private sector or getting the private sector involved in supply chain management. This, we want to talk about how to get you guys excited about getting into healthcare, because we need professionals in the space. We don't just need the people in the space to become supply chain professionals, we need more prof uh, supply chain professionals to get excited about getting into the space. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I started off, uh, Liesl, this first slide is specifically for you. That is a pharmacy in Mumbai that I took a photograph of. That is a retail pharmacy in Mumbai. And as you can see, they're using highly chaotic put away. Uh, <laughs> And I don't think they're using demand-driven MRP for their replenishment, no. So yeah, we have some challenges in the space, but it's well, worth, it's well worth playing in. So if you look at the, the environment of healthcare, everybody gets all antsy about it. They go, ooh, no, it's pharmaceuticals, it's medicine, it's special. Oh, no, it's, it's healthcare, it's different. Well, it's, bad news is it's actually not, right? It's actually just supply chain. And it's good, logical, hardcore supply chain. And people will say to me, oh, no, but we, we've got this, we've got this whole thing about regulatory compliance. Well, try moving liquor, yeah? Or, oh, no, we've got cold chain requirements. Well, the whole cold chain requirement of the entire South African pharmaceutical market runs to about 60,000 60, cases a year that we do in cold chain management. Pick and Pay Long Meadow does 790,000 cases a week in regulated and validated cold chain management. But I'm not supposed to use South African examples because all the people in public health get all, oh, but that's South Africa, it doesn't work anywhere else. Well, you'd be interested to know that in Kenya, the Flower Growers Association of Kenya last year shipped 150,000 tons of cut flowers by validated cold chain out of Nairobi and the Kenyan Fruit Growers Association moved 160,000 tons, together constituting just over 10 Boeing 747s, 10 jumbo jet freighters per day, flying out of Nairobi Airport off to the markets of Europe, North America, and South Africa in cold chain systems validated by Waitrose, uh, Tesco's, Woolworths, and um, Whole Foods, of all people. But when it came time for somebody to put together a conference to talk about cold chain pharmaceuticals, they held it in Nairobi and they flew in plain loads of people from all around the world to come and talk about cold chain in pharmaceuticals. Do you think they invited anybody from the Kenyan Fruit Growers Association or the Kenyan Flower Growers Association? Mm -mm. So the point of the story is, it's actually not that different. It's supply chain. And in fact, there's great stuff that you guys know inside out and backwards and forwards, that you could be applying in the public health space and doing great work in the public health space, but there's all this smoke and mirrors about how hard it is. And so, yes, we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the ideas of what we can do to change the environment. We're going to talk about the, uh, the things that need to happen. But in order to set the scene, I do need to just tell you a few stories about some of the crazy stuff that goes on and give you a couple of my own theories about how things should work and how you make the world turn from left to right. 
I did leave that picture in down the bottom, though, for just as a bit of an, 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 a nudge. So um, when they ran this uh, conference in East Africa on cold chain, the USAID guys said, oh, but we didn't know. So I sent them the photograph of their USAID-funded conference of the Kenyan Flower Growers Association. Because it wasn't the guy who was speaking's fault, I put the Flower Growers Association's logo over his face for uh, his own modesty. But um, it just shows even the donors don't talk to themselves about some of the things that they're up to. If you look at the circles of life, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to do the, the Lion King lecture of remember who you are, but it's, we, in, in, in business, we talk about how we actually design and operate supply chain models. So we look at the operational requirement, we define and design, we implement, we operate, and we figure out how to continually improve that. So that's about how you manage a business. In quality management, somebody else had the slide up earlier. In fact, it was Gavin who had the slide up earlier with the, uh, the do, measure, act, and plan. And that's the quality management thing. But the third circle of life in our space is environmental management. And that's this concept of trying to change the rules under which we have to function. It's the easiest thing in the world for people to worry and, and, and get upset that the regulations as they are make it impossible for them to achieve the things they'd like to. Well, if you don't like the rules, get them changed. You can't just sit and lament about them. But if you want to get rules and regulations changed, you actually have to start in this cycle. And so you start off with the process of advocacy, and you drive the political policy change. And once you have the policy change, you then have to get the regulatory change. And once you have the regulatory change, then you can influence practice. So if the practice is wrong, don't, set, don't, what, don't complain that the way it's operating is bad if you haven't gone and made the effort to try and get the advocacy in place in order to affect the policy to change the regulations so that you can get to the change of practice. It's, it's one of the most fundamental things in the public health space is that there's a lot of legacy. Somebody else was talking about the colonial legacy of the supply chain models that we've inherited across the continent. We can't just live with them as they are. We have to get them changed, and the way to do that is you've got to go all the way back to the beginning of the cycle. So a couple of the, the war stories, <laughs> some of the fun stuff that goes wrong and goes weird in this space of public health. Um, we still run around trying to do remote procurement from factories in India and China. So we're trying to do a procurement for the government of Ethiopia. What better way to do that than to try and contract with a factory halfway around the world? Instead of forcing those manufacturers to move their product closer to the market so you could actually engage with them on far shorter order delivery lead times. And those of you who were playing beer games yesterday will know that uh, the, the greatest way in which you can actually manage fluctuations in your uh, inventory requirements is to have the shortest order delivery lead time you can. But running annual procurements of pharmaceuticals with a six-month order delivery lead time at a factory halfway around the world is not the way to fix that. Another one is the, uh, <laughs> the, the concept of this, um, uh, the way in which uh, the, the actual procurements are done on an annual basis. So instead of saying, like we do now in South Africa, we say, okay, we'll do the procurement once every three years. We'll decide who we're going to buy from, but then we'll draw down against that contract over a three-year period. Sounds like the kind of thing you would do in a normal environment, yeah, in a normal supply chain. Well, no, we're still in the global health space. We're doing one procurement a year and buying in all we think we're going to need for the next 12 months and hoping like hell it's kind of accurate, right? So moving away from the old styles of contracting into modernized contracting is the kind of insights that supply chain practitioners know inside out and need to be bringing that learning into a public health space. Because we live with this thing of your chemist knows best. We have pharmacists and masters of public health graduates littering the supply chain practices of the governments of Africa. And so instead of having people who've studied supply chain theory, we have people who've studied pharmacy running warehouses and managing fleets of vehicles. It is the most bizarre dislocation of logic you could ever imagine. And having gone and looked at some of the pharmacy courses that they're taught, 
supply chain may make up one page of lecture notes out of a four-year degree. All right? But these are the people that the documents, the regulations say have to run the supply chain. And those are the people who are making up the policies. Those are the people who are making up the regulations. They're making them up because they actually don't have any basis in supply chain practice. So with the real supply chain people, please get involved. And that then brings us to the last thing on there, which is this thing of government-owned, government-operated. I will use these acronyms all the time because it confuses the daylights out of people. Go, 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 co, 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 all right? Government-owned, government-operated. That means the government owns the warehouses, the government owns the trucks, and the government runs the lot. And those of you who listened to Gavin earlier we would have heard just how miserable an existence that leads to if that's the way you work. GOCO is where the government owns the facilities and the contractor operates it for them. And then COCO is where the contractor owns the facilities and the contractor does the operations. Anyone want to guess which is the cheapest one to run? Sorry? The last one. Do you think the COCO one's the cheapest one to run? In fact, it's not. It's the middle one. It's the GOCO one. In the work that we've done, we can show that we can take 21% of costs out from a government-owned, government-operated into a contractor-owned, contractor-operated. But in fact, if we use the government assets, we don't have to have the cost of capital. We don't have to have the depreciation on our income statement. And we can actually take out 37% of costs. So the best way is to go and run the facilities for them rather than to have to build, buy and build your own facilities and run them because of the way in which it would affect your income statement and your costing models. The ultimate one is, in fact, where you can get to a GOCO PPP. I'll just make that up. Anyway, no, a GOCO PPP says, so we take the government-owned buildings, and we go in and we run them, but we don't just run their requirements in the buildings, we do our private operations in there too. And out of the profit that we make on our private operations, we subsidize the government's requirements. And so that is, in fact, the ultimate way. Supply chain is all about economies of scale. How do we create economies of scale in these markets, merge the private sector and the public sector requirements together? So that's really the, the absolute ultimate dream outcome for us. I changed this next slide earlier today because um, I saw somebody who had the pile of yellow books on their slide. Somebody had a pile of MSH yellow books on a slide. Now it was you. Uh, ah, it was the guy from Sudan. That's right. It was in Dominique's thing. So this is a book that was originally published in 1982. It was revised in 1997. It's now 21 years old. They've just done a new version, which is available online, but not as a book. That book has sold 10,000 copies around the world in six, across 60 countries. Okay? And you cannot believe the supply chain practices that are espoused in there as best practice. This is the book that is used to teach every public health logistician as the, in their MPH programs. And yet, the concepts and the theorems that are in there are beggar belief in terms of supply chain practice. And one of the most interesting parts is the piece on outsourcing in, I think it's 186 pages, the book, the piece on outsourcing is half of one column on half of one page. Right? Um, but there's an entire section dedicated to logistics management information systems, warehouse management systems, uh, um, transport management systems, IT stuff all over the place. But if you go and apply technology into a dysfunctional operation, what do you get? A more dysfunctional operation. Right? Technology is the amplifier the great uh, quote of Gates in his first book. And if you have a business that's operating really, really well, and you apply technology, you bring efficiencies. But if you have a business that is operating as a completely dysfunctional entity and you throw technology on top, what do you get? An even worse mess. Well, in fact, you get an even worse mess that costs you a lot more. A couple of things that we've done over the years as uh, Imperial Logistics, um, we've done a couple of things that really have shifted the game around a bit uh, and that I think are worth digging into just to show how new business concepts and old business logic can actually still bring lots of benefit to the space. So the first thing is the concept of buffering. 
right? Again, it's not supply chain Nobel Prize winning stuff, but it was brand new in the public health arena when we brought it to bear about 10 years ago. And what had happened was there'd been a few attempts made by various people at managing buffer stock in public health supply chains up to now. The first one that I was involved with was um, what I refer to as Parapipe, the one in the bottom left corner. And that was a program that was put together by the Dutch government in the early 2000s where they went and bought a whole bunch of antiretrovirals and they put it in a warehouse in Joburg. And the idea was that if somebody's pipeline ran out of stock, they could replenish from here. There was only two things wrong. The first was that we were working in an environment where the price of antiretrovirals was going down every month. And the second was the short shelf life of the products in that phase of the evolution of the drugs meant that they only lasted for two years. And so within three months of the stock being purchased, you could buy fresh stuff cheaper and it still had full shelf life. They spent $2 million on buffer stock in that project. We burnt every single box. We never delivered a single unit in the lifetime of the project. We burnt the lot. The top left, pre-pipe, that's what the TB guys do. So they've said to the manufacturers, you keep it at your house, and we'll tell you when we want it. Sounds like a great idea. It means that they don't have to buy it in advance. They have got some level of volume commitments, but it doesn't mean that they have to bring it and store it at their cost. But what happens? You're still sitting, pulling inventory from a facility halfway around the world with a six to eight week shipping time on the water. So your total order delivery lead time is very difficult to get below three months. Top right, the post pipe. Well, that's the classic central medical stores model. That's what Gavin was talking about, about what we're trying to shut down in South Africa, because that doesn't work either. Especially if you're in an annual procurement cycle where you buy once a year and you dump it all into the environment and hope like hell that it was close to what you required. The intrapipe model is the one that we developed and deployed for the US government and for um, the, the HIV program of the US government. And that we ran for 10 years. And in that period, we ran at a 99% on time in full. We had a 0% stock out and we had a 0.15% at value of goods, 0.15% expiry and destruction for, uh, for expiry of goods. So the buffering at a regional level, we bought the stuff, we brought it close to the market. We put it in Kenya to service East Africa. We put it in Joburg to service SADC. We put it in Ghana to service West Africa. Three buffer locations. That's the performance levels we achieved. Nobody in public health has ever done it before or since. And in fact, it's been like the best double-blind controlled study you could ever done in science. They decided in the new contract uh, about three years ago to do away with it. And what has happened? They've moved from 99% on time in full to where they're now up to 37%, I think. They were as low as nine. Yeah? That's literally how bad it got by changing back to the old remote procurement, long order delivery lead time. The top right one, product affordability, is a thing that we're doing uh, where we're saying, if you can get the price of product in the market as low as possible, the volume of growth you can achieve is huge. Now stick with me, it's quite a complex logic, but it's, it's actually really simple once you get your head around it. Basically what it says is that the vast majority of people live on the left side of the economic demographic. So most people live to the left of what I call the pharmaceutical affordability point. In other words, they cannot afford quality medicines themselves. They can't afford to buy and pay for. But if you can move that pharmaceutical affordability point to the left, in other words, if you can drive down the price of medicines, look what happens to the area under the curve. The area under the curve is the market of opportunity you expose through price reduction. And profit equals volume times margin. And so as long as your volume is growing faster, than the margin erosion per unit, your profits go up. You with me? Straight, simple, logical economics. That's how much it costs, that's how small your market is. You push that price point left, the volume goes through the roof. And those of you who've been around in healthcare for a while will remember in 2005 when we launched single exit pricing, the world was terrified. It was going to, the world as we knew it was gonna to come to an end. Well, guess what happened? We all made more money than we knew what to do with because the price of medicines to patients came down, 
and the volumes went through the roof because more and more people could afford to buy quality products. And so that is something we spend loads of time on, and we're actually busy with a big initiative now where we're rolling out a mega distributor model to drive competitive forces in small to mid-sized markets in Africa, because in most of these markets, you've got an exclusive importer who sells to a distributor, who sells to a sub-distributor, who sells to a wholesaler, and that markup on markup on markup on markup means the price goes all the way to the right. We go in and we say, mm -mm -mm -mm. we're going to contract with five wholesalers in the country. We're going to direct deliver to each one of them. And we're going to monitor their single tier delivery to retail. So we take out all those markup on markup on markup layers. The price to the patient goes left and the volume of the market goes up. The last one on this slide of the clever things that we're doing or fun things that we're doing is down the bottom right. And that's in Johnny Clinics. And Johnny Clinics is a nurse-owned franchise model that we launched in 2010. We now, we just launched our 50th clinic. We see 25,000 patients a month in South Africa. Um, so that's us up to now 300,000 consults a year. So that's 300,000 interactions a year that the public sector doesn't have to provide and fund. And what we've done within Johnny is we've proven a couple of, a couple of things. The first is we've proven that there's a whole pile of people out there that are not only just willing, but are also able to fund their own primary care if there's an affordable, accessible, quality service available to them. And the second thing that we've proven is that nurse practitioners providing primary care can fill a massive need in the healthcare continuum. Off the back of that, we developed two other things called clinic in a box and warehouse in a box. It's basically prefabricated clinics and prefabricated warehouses. Um, and a lot of people who are in supply chain design get a bit offended when I say this, but a warehouse is a warehouse is a warehouse. You don't need to redesign every one every time. All right? It needs some receiving space, it needs some storage space, it needs some st standing space, and it needs some dispatch. How hard does this get? So we created component model prefabricated warehouses. And the biggest one we've done is just over 5,000 square meters. Prefabricated, it literally ships with its fire extinguishers and its little signs to tell you where to put them. It ships with its SOP manuals, and it goes flat-packed in containers. It's like, um, what's the guys, the Scandinavian guys with the flat-packed furniture? IKEA! It's IKEA for warehouses. Uh, and we've done, I think we're up to about 16 now that we've done all over the continent. The clinic in a box is even more bizarre, and that is a flat-packed clinic. Goes in, doesn't even need a concrete slab. Just needs a gravel site, relatively flat. They're self-leveling, they've got self-leveling jacks in them, so it doesn't have to be perfectly flat. And those were doing projects of over 100 units at a time for governments. We're just busy with one at the moment for over 100 units in Malawi. And the great thing about them, we've taken infrastructure, and instead of making it a project, we've made it a product. And it's something you can just say, I need 50 of those in those places, go. And we get on and deliver them. Some real learnings and experiences of the space, and again, for the supply chain folks in the room, it's probably just going to be entertaining, but hopefully it'll show to you that it's not a very, very hard place to make a big impact. It's very hard to make a big impact in that there's a whole bunch of people who try and stop you because they like the way it's always been, but in fact, there's such a big need and there's so much to be done. It's not that hard to look smart. So the first one down there is what I call the rule of 72. Anybody remember their high school economics? All right, compound interest, all right? The rule of 72. Take 72, divide it by your interest rate, and it tells me how many years it'll take for my money to double in the bank. So I put 100 bucks in the bank at 9% interest, eight years later, I've got 200 bucks, yeah? Same thing applies to warehouse management. If you have, in the South African Public Health Service, a volume increase of 18% per annum, which is what we've had to deal with for more than 10 years now, right? that means that every four years, you've got to double the capacity of your warehousing. And there's not a government in the world that can move that fast. There's no way they're going to allocate funding, procure infrastructure, run the project, commission the facilities to be able to keep up with that sort of growth. There has to be a transition to engagement with the private sector. 
So that's the rule of 72. The rule of 72 segues straight into Bill's Law. Now, Bill's Law is my, it's my greatest name dropping I'll ever do in my life. Uh, I got uh, invited with Gavin to go and have lunch with Bill Gates at the AIDS conference in Durban two years ago. And we were sitting there, and he was chatting about our projects and what we were doing together. And I gave him my lecture about the rule of 72 and the doubling time, etc. And he looked at me and said, I thought you were the supply chain specialist. I said, yeah. He said, well, you should know that's not true. I went, well, ba 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 He says, all you got to do is double the velocity. I went, that's right. So I now call it Bill's Law. You don't have to double the capacity of your warehouses. You either have to double the capacity of your warehouses or you have to double the velocity of the throughput. Now, some of you will have worked in uh, the uh, PFSA environment, and I'm not talking out of turn. I have their authority to use this, da this data point. So those of you who are in supply chain, how many of you would be happy if you knew that your stock turns per year were 0.9? 0.9 stock turns per year is what the government of Ethiopia currently runs at. Do you think they need a bit of help? I think so. I think we can do something there. 7 times 27 equals 70 is a rule that Gavin and I created in 2012 where we did a data analytics process where we looked at the top seven vendors of medicines in Tukarteng. We took the top 27 hospitals, we deduped the catalogs, and the volumes and the orders, and what we showed was that we could take 70% of the volume out of the network if we just got those seven guys to deliver to those 27 guys. So what does it come out at? It's 184 deliveries. It's a tiny volume of deliveries per two-week cycle. We had to administer and manage, and we took 70% of the volume out of the warehouse. And that's why they were able to play soccer in the warehouse within six months of us starting the project. And we did that by moving to direct deliveries from the manufacturers to those points of care. So you don't have to do everything on the first day. All you've got to do is think smart and use normal, logical practice. CCMDD is just beyond comprehension. Um, with, before I go laboring into the point, how many of you were in Gavin's talk earlier? Show me your hands. OK, I better tell you the story then. CCMDD, Centralized Chronic Medicines Dispensing and distribution, yes. Basically, patients who are on chronic medication used to have to go to the hospital every month to get their new script. With CCMDD, what has happened, and it was put together by the Last Mile guys and by National Department of Health, and what they've managed to do is they've now got one and a half million patients who go to the clinic twice a year, and the rest of the year, they go to clicks, they go to Discam, they go wherever, and they pick up their medicines. And it's done through a central dispensing bureau within the Department of Health. And I was working it out when you were talking earlier. That essentially means that program today has reduced patient engagements in the public sector by 15 million consults per year. Because they've gone from 12 visits per annum to two visits per annum. You've taken out the 18 minus the three, so 15 million consults a year you've managed to reduce by. The other thing that Gavin was talking about was how we've instituted this practice of transparent analytics and reporting. <coughs> we thought of calling it name and shame, but some people were offended by that. So um, and transparent reporting of supply chain performance, but not only showing the data to the market of how the vendors are performing, but using it to inform the next tender. So using it to drive the decision about who gets the next order based on how well they supplied this time round. The one down the bottom, I just don't want to dwell on for a second, because especially for the public health folk in the room, this is one that we've been talking about for some time and have never really managed to figure out how to get it right. There are three dimensions to the way in which we manage inventory. The first is the price of the product, the second is the shelf life of the product, and the third is the clinical impact of an out-of-stock, stock failure, okay? So imagine if over here we've got oral contraceptives, okay? Oral contraceptives are cheapest chips, one of the lowest cost things in a public health system. 
they've got a shelf life of about 300 years, okay? Sarcastic, obviously. But they, they, they don't expire, right? Okay? But if you have an unwanted pregnancy, that's a pretty shitty thing to have happen, yeah? So being out of stock on that thing is not clever. So we've got a product that's really cheap, that lasts forever, with a huge clinical impact if you haven't got it. Where should you store that? In the clinics. Put all the stock as far forward as you can and make sure nobody's ever at risk of being out of stock. There's no point in having it in a central warehouse. Ship the stuff to the front. The other end is boom slung anti-venom. Okay? What's the clinical impact if you get bitten by a boom slung and there's no anti-venom? You're dead. Okay? Quick as that. So clinical impact, pretty important. Shelf life, 30 days, 30 days. What's the cost? $35,000 a pop, yeah? So where do you keep that? You keep that, actually, this is the, the fact, you keep that in the manufacturer's fridge in Geneva, okay? No, you don't. You keep, you keep it centrally, and you replenish it as fast as you can, right? Now, there's an application for drones, okay? But it's not a case of you're going to ship that stuff down the front end, and it's not a situation where you're going to keep it somewhere that it's going to take three days to get it where it needs to go. Because by that stage, you need a cran seed, not an injection. So you see the logic. Now, that, this is called segmentation. Ever heard of that in the supply chain industry? Uh-huh. But the public health people think they invented the term about three years ago. It's the most crazy thing in the world. It's good logical supply chain practice, and all we have to do is make sure that we apply it in the space. So the Wayne Gretzky question, where the hell is the puck going to go? What comes next? What is it we need to be thinking about, and what is it that we want to apply our minds to? Did you all read it in time? No, uh, go back, she says. It's great. It's the second time I've seen a Dilbert cartoon today. Somebody else had one earlier. Yeah. But isn't it amazing? If you want to get a huge crowd in a room, just use the B word, blockchain. Put it somewhere in your title. It'll fill the place. Yeah? It's the most bizarre. It's like a secret society. Yeah? At some stage, somebody's going to go, the emperor has no clothes. I oh, know that's Bitcoin. That's the Ponzi scheme. Now, on blockchain, <laughs> blockchain actually has got a foundation and a logic. And blockchain, in fact, is a fundamental part of what we're doing around serialization and authentication. To give you a bit of an idea why, so you see the data point there, 500 million patient packs a year, 43 million patient packs a month. That's how much medicine we move around the continent within Imperial Logistics every month. That's a thousand packs a minute, all day, all year. That's a lot of responsibility and a lot of accountability. But think about the logic. So from manufacturer all the way to patient, you're probably going to see about 10 scans per life cycle. Uh, 43 million packs a month. That means we're going to generate about half a billion records a month just in our supply structures. And we're going to do that from about 50 manufacturing sites across 16 manufacturers around the world, uh, 15, 20 international freighting partners, uh, 105 in-country wholesaling partners, and just on 600,000 points of care across a catalog of 35,000 SKUs. You want to do that with a serial database update? Or would you like to use synchronous database update management a la blockchain? All right, so there's no question that as we move into the world of serialization and authentication, we're going to have to use blockchain logic to be able to get the level of visibility, transparency, and integration um, and mutual authentication that's necessary to make it work. The scale, the impact of the fake medicine market is beyond comprehension. The data points that dished out, 60% of anti-malarials in Nigeria, fake or counterfeit. Look at those data points around the number of deaths per annum as a result of fake medicine. Right? 
Uh, that's the kind of stuff that with good, rigorous supply chain practice, we can fix and we can make a fundamental difference to. Because make no mistake, you don't do it through regulation. You don't do it through having a quality vetting bureau. We've spent 30 years trying to create regulatory agencies around this continent, and that's the data points that we get. So let's accept it hasn't worked, and let's figure out how to do something better. Visibility and analytics networks are fundamental to our future. It is the only way we're going to be able to get the kind of data visibility and transparency that we require to run big, multi-market, multi-product, multi-disease profile uh, supply chains that are effective. And remember those data points from earlier, 18% volume growth per annum in South Africa. Ethiopia is running at about 12% volume growth per annum. Those are big rates of change in supply structures that are not very robust. There's a lot that we need to be doing. So the whole logic of the, uh, the van approach is to say, first, we need the policy underpin. We need the right regulations and the right practices and the right approaches. So we can't just live in the milieu that we find. We have to work hard at getting that right. Fix the environment. The second is the people. We've got to work on the skills of the people, and we've got to get the right people in the room and on the job. Processes, if you don't have decent processes and you don't have controls, guys that worked with me for many years will remember me banging tables 15 years ago. I want good people, rock-solid processes, and management discipline. Because if you don't have those things, you don't have a supply structure. And if you have got those things, then add the technology on top, and that will then optimize your performance and develop the way in which you can deliver for the patients you're trying to serve. One of the last reasons for getting involved in this thing is the most important one. Getting into public health supply chain is really, really cool because you get to do something that really, really matters. I struggled in my prior job to get excited about delivering cell phones. I really did. I tried very hard, but I just I couldn't get into it. It didn't. This makes you get out of bed in the morning, all right? This is doing stuff that saves lives. This is doing stuff that impacts patients. This is doing stuff that fundamentally changes the way in which people are able to live their lives. And it doesn't matter which side of the vortex you believe in. Do sick people get poor or do poor people get sick? All right? Healthcare is a fundamental in driving the transition to where healthy people hold their jobs, earn more money, manage their lives better, move up the scale, and you drive the wealth creation path of this great continent that we live in. So you're doing something that's really good, and as I've hopefully demonstrated to you this afternoon, there's lots and lots of space to do stuff really, really well. And just to give you an idea of the business opportunity, the US government uh, is currently spending just over $5 billion per year on donor-funded programmatic support work. Uh, the Global Fund spends just about the same. Um, I don't know, how much does Gates spend, Tom? <laughs> but if you take the donor environment of the US government and the, uh, and the Global Fund and the, uh, the private donors, um, you're easily running into that close to that $10 billion a year worth of business that has to get done. And then the public sector, the governments of Africa, are adding money on top of that. So just the public health business opportunity is of an order of magnitude that should be attractive to any organization sitting here. And it's not capped out by any manner or means. That thing down the bottom of 1990-90 says, hmm, today, 20 million people in the world are on antiretrovirals. There are 32 million people living with HIV AIDS. The goal of UN AIDS by 2025 is to get to where 90% of them are on HIV therapy. So 90% of 32, 93, 27, 29, 29, okay, 30 million, and we're on 20. So there's a 50% growth potential just 
in antiretrovirals. And that's before somebody finally delivers us a malaria vaccine that we then have to manage cold chain support for across the continent in order to get that job done. So big business today, big business opportunity in the future, and so a great place to build your career in. And then there are some great people to work with as well. So you've heard, uh, those of you who were at Tripp's talk earlier will have heard about the African Resource Center, and that is the ability of the private sector to engage with the health sector uh, and to deliver IP, to deliver concepts, to deliver guidance. So you don't have to change careers and come into public health. You can help and work with the people who are trying to drive change in public health by partnering with someone like ARC. And finally, people that deliver, an organization that we partner very closely with because we do believe that we can, as an organization, bring to bear knowledge, experiences, best practices of what can actually be done. And so when you get to the end of the day, by 2030, the goal of Dr. Tedros, the new Director General of the World Health Organization, is the concept of universal health care. You don't get to universal health care without a hardcore, robust, and effective supply chain model to support it. And that really is what we're about, and hopefully we'll get some of you excited to come and join us doing it too. Thanks very much for your time.